Thanks everybody for coming. I want to first start off by thanking the, the folks that hosted us tonight, Pillsbury. Um, Pillsbury actually has an incubator program that works with startups, and if you're interested, please uh, contact Jamie Graham. She said she was going to leave some business cards here, but I don't see them. But uh, Anthony, you can also ask Anthony to hear his as well. So we got a tight schedule tonight. I'm going to jump right into things. Um, for those of you who are new here, welcome. Thanks for coming. What this event is about is that as entrepreneurs, uh, those of us who are interested in these practices view entrepreneurship as a profession. We think that entrepreneurship has its own set of skills, its own set of best practices, and a lot of those best practices, unfortunately, have not traditionally been taught very well in our corporate settings and in our business schools. And so we get together once a month to come exchange with each other ideas on what's working and what's not working. And we also get joined by outside experts from around the world who also contributed to entrepreneurship. And this month, we are joined by Ash Moria. Go ahead and wave, Ash. Hello, everyone. <laughs> we can hear you. Um, Ash is joining us from Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you already know Ash's uh, blog, ashmoria.com. Um, Ash is one of the most widely read and referenced startup bloggers out there. His stuff is absolutely awesome. I refer to it all the time, and I think you look, if you look at um, Venture Hacks or Hacker News or Eric Reese or David McClure, any of the top angels or VCs or, or uh, bloggers out there, you'll find that they reference Ash's stuff all the time. Ash also has a new book out called Running Lean, and Ash was nice enough to share a draft copy of the book with me last night. Um, it is absolutely awesome. If uh, any of you guys have read uh, 37 Signals Getting Real, you're going to know the type of book it is. It's better than getting real, and if I wasn't here right now, I would be at home reading it. It's probably the best tutorial I've seen so far on how to bootstrap and get a startup going. Um, so with that introduction of mine, Ash, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, what your motivation was to write the book, and about your products? Sure. Well, thanks a lot, Kevin. And, and uh, yeah, that was a, a great intro. I guess I couldn't couldn't beat that. But um, uh, just a little bit about myself. I have been uh, running my own startup for several years now. Uh, the motivation for the book was really very organic. It it really came about um, as an offshoot of my blogging. And even the blog itself was not something I set out to do. It was um, me me stumbling into customer development, wanting to get better at it, having more questions than answers, and pretty much putting a question up uh, every week to myself and then just really researching it and then writing about it in a very transparent manner. Because I found that a lot of the, 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 the works out there were, while very powerful, were still very much in the theoretical level and were very retrospective. And so what I wanted to do was really make it a lot more tactical. And so that's how the blog started. That's how the book started. And in the process, I've actually been um, funneling my way into a few products that might actually come out of it as well. So that's just a little bit about myself. Okay, you've got to give us a little hint. What are some of the products? You've got to tell us a little bit about user cycle. <laughs> well, so in the course of uh, doing lean startups, one of the things that I stumbled with in my last product was really managing the, the user funnel. And I became very big on metrics and, and tracking, uh, you know, tracking users to metrics and, 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 and measuring things that way. But one of the fundamental pro problems you have, especially when you're starting out, is that you don't have enough data. You don't have enough users. You don't have enough, enough data points to actually wait for statistical results. The other thing is that metrics tell you only what's going on or what's happening. They don't tell you why things are happening. So for that, you really have to couple people in the process. And Eric Fries had a great mem called Metrics Are People Too. And really what I am trying to do is further that a little bit and really make users and people very much part of that process. So being able to, to diagnose your funnel with a people-centric approach is really what user cycle is about. So it's about, uh, it's about visualizing the user adoption life cycle and then making certain, getting certain insights and doing certain activities, whether it's diagnostic or marketing related, uh, based on those, those types of things. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Ash, for that introduction. We're going to keep things rolling along because, as I said, we've got a packed schedule tonight. So the way tonight we're going to work things a little bit different than we did last month. We're going to have two startups present. We're going to take a 20-minute intermission, and then we're going to have the final startup present. With each, with each startup presents, we're going to have 10 minutes of presentation by the startup that goes through a set of slides, and then we're going to have 10 minutes of interaction with Ash up on the screen. Um, 
for those of you, we, we don't actually take questions during that 10 minutes just to keep things moving along, but we'd ask all of you to please tweet to the uh, ta hashtag Lean Startup DC as you have comments, as you have questions. Ash is going to take some questions off the Twitter feed, and Patrick and I as well, will as well, and then we'll pass those on to the presenter. Uh, so with that in mind, we'll go ahead and get started with our first company. Uh, Nathan Gilmore is going to present uh, Team Gantt. Basically, we're a web-based Gantt chart. Um, are you all familiar with Gantt charts? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we, uh, we decided to make a web-based version. This is a little screenshot of uh, just a, I guess a demo project that we made just to, to kind of give you a visual with, with the groups and the tasks and critical paths and, and all. Um, so this has, this is basically what we have right now. We have 1,300, it's probably a little bit more than that right now, as far as beta accounts, about 1,400 projects, and we're actually projecting that sometime by the end of the week we'll have over 2,000 users. Uh, we're shooting to go official on Saturday. Um, we're hoping, we were pushing for last Saturday, it just it didn't happen. So we'll see how this Saturday goes. Um, <laughs> we're pretty confident it'll be Saturday. <laughs> okay, we are uh, we are bootstrapped. We don't have any funding. We've been pretty much working nights and weekends, and uh, that's really pretty much Saturday mornings is what that is. Uh, this we've been working on it for about a year, so we've had all kinds of distractions along the way. This would be one of them. <laughs> this cost us about a month. But it was worth it. <laughs> so far. <laughs> so far. Uh, this is Johnny's, Johnny's father actually uh, built a church in, uh, I think, less time than it took us to build Team Gantt. So John was very involved with that as well. It took some time. Um, so why did we start Team Gantt? We, we had a problem. We like to work off Gantt charts. But the issue was we couldn't share them. Um, you know, I would, I would create one and our the other team members would not be able to access it unless I print it out or email them. And every time there needed to be a change, we'd have to have a progress meeting and it just really got to be a hassle to use it and maintain it. <clears throat> so we looked for a solution. We needed something that was web-based, multi-user. You could assign users to tasks, track the progress, and we really wanted it to be really simple. <clears throat> Basically, just a collaborative version of a uh, simple, easy-to-use Microsoft project. But um, we, we couldn't find it, so we thought, well, let's build it. And uh, before we, we really wanted to do that, though, we wanted to determine uh, problem solution fit, make sure that this is a problem uh, that people want solved. So one thing we did was we did a, a quick test. We put um, we got one of those coupons for $100 of free Google AdWords. And we, uh, we put up kind of really an ugly landing page, <laughs> but um, and it had some pricing on it. And we were able to get five email signups out of that, uh, so we were we were excited. <laughs> Maybe people actually want this. Uh, so we started working on a minimum viable product. Now, one thing we didn't do a lot of was we didn't do a lot of customer interviews right away. Uh, we should have, but we didn't really know about it at the time. We kind of learned about the lean startup movement as we've been going through this. Uh, since then, we have done some customer interviews, though. We built a basic version of it. It worked. It was really basic, but it worked. So at this point, the learning starts. Um, this is where we were getting feedback emails. We were getting customer surveys, phone calls. We did some usability testing, and we started learning a lot. Uh, just real quick on the survey techniques, what we did is one thing we tried is we put a link right on the home page, and I just said, fill out this survey and let us know what you think. We really only got about one response a week from that. Uh, so then we said, maybe we could try sending an email out. And when we did that, um, just to the people from the last like week or two, 
uh, we had about 20 responses uh, within a day. So sending an email out really seemed to help uh, just encourage people to actually do it. We kept it really short. We had four questions. Uh, what can we do to improve Team Gann? Additional comments. Can we send you an email uh, to clarify any answers? And uh, how would you feel if you can no longer use Team Gann? That last, that last question, you, some of you may be familiar with, is kind of an important one. These are the four options that people have uh, to answer that question. Not disappointed, somewhat disappointed, very disappointed, or I no longer use Team Gann. <clears throat> According to Sean Ellis, uh, he, he says that you should shoot for 40% of your users wanting to be uh, very disappointed. And this kind of indicates that there's some demand and that uh, people want to use your project, your product. So our first results were 22%. So we listened to some feedback, we worked on some things, we did it again, and we hit 40.7. So it's, it's, you know, doesn't mean that we're set, but it's, it's somewhat of a, uh, just an indicator to use. So uh, another thing we did is usability testing. We saw this on Ash's blog using usertesting.com. Uh, this is a great site. I mean, I think we spent $79, and we had three people log in, use our site, and it gets video recorded, and they're actually talking and saying you know, what they're trying to do and what they don't understand as they're using the site. And that really, we learned a lot from that. Uh, that was great. So another thing we do is we do continuous deployment. We're just always releasing. We do a lot of small releases. We release quick. And as soon as we have a new feature, we put it out. And that just allows us to learn sooner. Another thing that uh, we, we learned too from Ash's blog is developing a path to customers from day one. So we did this with, with SEO. This is kind of a chart of just our account signups. Uh, we initially put a, just a basic site out there kind of end of last year. And it just took probably about six months or so to get some traction. And really since like August, we even released a new version of our site and we started getting a lot more uh, signups. So we're gonna talk just real briefly about our uh, SEO approach here and, and what we did. We're definitely not SEO experts. Uh, we just did some basics and, uh, and it worked out well. One of the main things we did was we wanted to be real strategic with our keywords. Uh, we didn't want to pick keywords that have a lot of competition. Uh, you know, we just really wanted to get some that low competition. It was extremely relevant to what we're doing and something that would still generate some good traffic. Uh, for that, we just used Google AdWords keyword tool. Uh, one, one, thing, one term we put in there was web-based Gantt chart. We thought, well, maybe that's a good one. And uh, you can kind of see the results. Um, the web-based Gantt chart generates about 320 searches a month. Had we done just Gantt chart, that would have been 201,000. We would have had just too much competition. We could have never gotten on the first page. Uh, online Gantt chart actually has, has 2,400 uh, hits a month. And uh, that was really the, what we decided to try and target. So, uh, John, you want to talk about this? Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess through me, so I'll go fast. Not, 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 not that I know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as Nathan talked about the uh, the content, uh, he, he did most of the writing for that. And I just did most of the, uh, the coding itself. So I, as, as he told you about the, the keywords, and then we use the H1 tags and the H2s and the bolds and all that. Cause I know a lot of people like to try to use divs as H1s and use CSS to give the H1 effect. But I read some things that browsers, or not browsers, um, search engines like the H1 better because it describes the page. So we would use the H1 and then overwrite the CSS um, with it to kind of give the flexibility that we wanted with it um, to get rid of that like, stupid, ridiculous margin it puts around it. Uh, also, we just put the metadata, which is um, the alt tags on the pictures and the titles to do all that, make sure we had valid HTML, and then a, um, a WordPress blog we added to the site. And really, since we added the WordPress and redid the site, I don't know if you guys remember the chart, where it really picked up, that's where the new site came into play. Um, the original site was two pages long. It was a home page and a sign-up page. We didn't really get much traffic from there, or traction, people staying. However, with the new site and the blog, 
and additional content that came from all that really allowed our our traffic to, to stay. Um, so right now, if you actually Google online Gantt chart, we're the first organic result. Um, as Nathan said, we didn't spend any money in AdWords outside of the additional or the original $100 gift card we had. So that was basically our SEO. I don't know what's on the next slide. Right, market fit. Uh, what do we have, like a minute? Yeah, one minute, yep. Okay, we'll just we'll skip through some of this. But the next next stage for us is product market fit, which basically means will people will people pay for this? Uh, will how will this fit into the market? So we want to test our pricing, find out if people will pay, continue to improve the usability, and really work with metrics and iterate based on those metrics. We decided not to do any free meal. We're, we're launching, we're set to launch uh, Saturday, as we said, and we don't want to do any free meal mainly because we want to test our premium model first. This is something uh, I believe Ash has talked about on his site as well. Uh, we want to make sure that people do want to pay, and we want to get that pricing model right before we really try and blow things up with a, with a freemium model. Uh, we're not doing any PR, we're not doing any marketing right now, this is really just a soft launch. The reason for that is, uh, we, again, we just want to get our funnel, uh, our metrics and everything working right and make sure we've got everything optimized before we really try and do any kind of big product launch or uh, press releases or anything like that. And this is really what we want to work on. This is our funnel here. Just uh, this is an example of one. How many people sign up? How many people create a project? How many people actually create a project with five tasks? And then how many people will actually pay? So that's pretty much it right there. Here's a couple things we're looking for feedback on. Uh, are we correct in waiting to do freemium? Is that the right choice? And how do we handle feedback requests that we do not have time to implement? Since we're bootstrapping, we just got a lot of feedback, and sometimes we can't do it. So that's it. Thank you. advantage of having just uh, come from reading Ash's book, so a lot of your questions are going to be answered, I think. <laughs> when you would, um, Ash, maybe kick things off for the people who may not be as familiar to some of these issues. Um, it, it looks like you guys started off doing more a lot of quantitative testing at first um, versus qualitative. Um, Ash, can you tell us a little bit of the difference between qualitative? What are we trying to learn with all this language, and what's the difference between qualitative and quantitative testing? Maybe some big picture stuff for people. Sure, and, and that, that's actually where I was going to start because I, I noticed that you, you mentioned the Sean Ellis test and you uh, had, a, had some questions there. One of the things that I found is when you're doing um, just surveys and you're doing qualitative testing, um, well, I guess when you're just using surveys, there's this fundamental assumption that you know the right questions to ask. And many times when you're starting out, that isn't the case. So I tend to prefer to do more open-ended interviews uh, from the beginning, and so the question that I would have for you, Nathan, is are you doing any any interviewing even now? And if you aren't, that might be something you might want to start um, building in. It's never too late to, to do any of that. Um, and so it's just kind of the, the big picture, again, I kind of touched on a little bit early on, is that with quantitative, you need a lot of data to really make uh, statistically significant results. But the good news with qualitative is that you can get very strong signals or against something with just a few, um, with, with, with really just a few responses. And the big reason, again, for that is that not only are you getting the answers, but you're getting the emotions and you're getting the reasons why people like or dislike something. So that's something that Steve Krug and, and Jacob Nielsen have used, especially in uh, usability testing, kind of to their advantage, where you can show a, a landing page or a home page and pretty much within five to eight responses be able to uncover 80% of the problem. So that, that's kind of where I kind of come from. I, I think at least in the early stages, you have to be very qualitative and really use surveys um, as a way to verify that over time. So once you have the answers you want to you know, once you have the questions you want to ask and you have some answers that you have in your mind that you then want to test, at that point, putting a survey like the Sean Ellis test or or even just putting service to say, these are three problems we're solving, number one, number two, number three, uh, which, which resonates with you the most. Now, you've already received some responses from your qualitative uh, interviewing, and what your hope is that they'll all align up, and so then you can take those responses and make them uh, quantitative and make them verify that way. 
Yeah, that's that's great advice. Uh, we have done some uh, actual user interviews, and uh, it's something we started a little late in the game, but we, you're absolutely right. We learned a lot from that, just from even doing a few. We've learned a lot from that. We, we should definitely do more. Uh, and then I guess even just on your one of your second questions on premium, I mean, that's, since you're going to mention that I do kind of recommend starting with the premium part first, I, I will come to that in a second, but I will say that in a way you have um, started with a variation of premium using the introductory free model where you aren't charging any users even though you're putting pricing up. Is there a reason why you started there? I know Sean Ellis recommends that as a way to, to drive learning and, and drive this option, but is there any, a reason other than that that you started there? Uh, the main reason was just it was in beta. So we said it was beta, we put the price up, we said this is what it's going to cost once we launch, uh, and everybody's account will get converted to a 30-day free trial. So we just left it in beta and just wanted to get some feedback as we were going, but now we're going to launch and, and test the pricing. Sure, and, and one of the things definitely in the, in the interviewing process would be to test the pricing as well. So, you know, there's one thing where you, you, you put up prices and you have these different plans and people sign up. Now you need to kind of go that next level. And that's where, again, the qualitative side first will give you a lot of reasons why people may want to pay or not for your product. And if you just do the quantitative and wait for things to happen, you might be waiting for a long time. So that's the other thing I'll throw out there. Yeah, that's great advice. And, it, and that's something, too, we have done uh, to an extent is just asking people, what do you think of our pricing? And uh, so far, we've gotten positive responses on it. Okay. Now, do you have an idea of who your customers are? So that's something I'm, I'm kind of, again, very big on is when you're initially starting out, yes, you want to address you know, anyone with a project that could potentially need a Gantt chart, but there are, there's a certain segment that needs, that uses Gantt more than others, that will pay for them more than others. Do you have any indication today of who those might be? Yeah, absolutely. We have a couple different markets that use the Gantt charts. Uh, primarily, it's web design companies. We have a lot of web design, a lot of small web design companies, teams of um, three to ten people, and they basically want to work on their Gantt charts and assign resources and work as a, uh, as a small company collaboratively. And I think too, one reason it's them and not so much like a construction industry is just uh, web designers are just on the web looking for stuff and they're looking for this kind of tool where it's a you know construction company uh, we have a few of them but they're just not as uh, as as into it they're not looking for it okay now i'll take some questions that have been coming over the feed one of them was from actually sean glass who asked if you if you tried just charging uh, before before starting with the free or, or even super premium have, have you just tried charging at, at any point? Uh, no, that's going to be Saturday. So, okay. so the thought is, um, and we'd like to some feedback on this, is basically all of the current beta users that we have, we're going to send them an email and basically say your account is being converted to a 30-day trial, which was on our website, so it's, they knew this was coming. But this is what that's going to be kind of how we test for sure uh, if they're going to pay. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, I guess my question would be, um, and I think you're probably going to hear too, Ashley. Um, if you thought about just not doing everybody at once with one beta thing, but testing different prices with, you know, doing this over several months with portions of the users, is that is that where you're going to go, Ash? Or yes, right. That's that's precisely where I'm going to go because again, some of the, the learning can kind of gets diluted when you are when you have pricing plans that range from you know, freelancer type people all the way to enterprise. The, the tactics and the methods to sell to those are so different that if you are getting an indication that there is a particular segment, um, in some ways almost kind of collapse the plans just down to one and really you know, build that beach and basically get that customer nailed down first uh, before trying to go upstream or downstream. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great suggestion. We should definitely give that some consideration. Sure. Yeah. But again, as like I said, the, the learning gets diluted, and your tactics will get very unfocused. If you happen to get, if you have a hundred paying develop, you know, say web de web designers, and all of a sudden one enterprise expresses interest, how are you going to react to that? So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of distractions that are just uh, that that kind of comment that can be weak signals that distract you, and some could be strong. So I, I always 
think it's, it's better to really just focus down on who you think your early adopters are, get the product right with them, um, and then figure out if, if there is an upstream or downstream path you can take from there. That's great. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, total time from when you guys started dreaming about this, uh, including the life interruptions that happened to all of us? Uh, one year, pretty much exactly. It was November of last year. Ash, I think if you have any time for one more question, if you want to ask, or one more comment, or... Uh... All right, well, I guess the, the, the thing that I will say is that I, I think you have a, a great gift right now, which is the SEO traffic. I mean, the, the online GAN, because I, I tried that myself, an online you know, GAN chart, you basically rank number one. And I think you know, it, it's, it's definitely a good sign. I know there's, there's a lot of traffic on GAN charts, not, not as much online GAN charts, but that's still a number one spot. And I would say you need to start creating content and start doing things so that you don't lose that spot. And I think that could be something you could leverage to your advantage uh, moving forward. Great. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Let's give this guy a round of applause. Thanks, guys. It takes a lot of courage to get up here in front of everybody and, uh, and talk about something when you're still working on it. So uh, we all appreciate you sharing your story with us. Well, we're happy to be here, and we're really excited to meet everybody. And uh, we really appreciate appreciate everything Kevin does and Patrick and everybody involved here. It's, it's a lot of work. That we've seen kind of talking with these guys over the last couple of months, and they do a lot. We appreciate it. Thanks. Next, we have Nip and Greg with My Web Career. All you, is this you, Greg? Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, who's the developer, right? Um, hi, folks. Um, so, my name is Greg Coyle. Um, I co founded uh, My Web Career in January of this year with uh, Nip, my co founder over here. And uh, one other individual who's not here this evening, Brian Wilson. Um, so, what, what we're going to do is just touch very briefly on what the company does problem we're trying to solve and how we're trying to solve it. Um, we'll just spend a minute or two on that. And then we're going to dive into some of the some of the things we've done well, some of the things we haven't done so well, some of the lessons we've learned. And uh, we'll throw out a couple of things maybe Ash could address as well. Um, so first of all, what do we do? Um, essentially what we do at my web career is we provide a service for career professionals like yourselves uh, that enables them to discover evaluate and monitor their online brand. Um, and the problem we're trying to solve Okay, so disregard the first slide, so the rest of them are better. But the problem we're trying to solve basically is that in this day and age your your online presence or online content that relates to you has an impact on your career potentially um, if you're looking to change position or if um, you're looking for a job or you're Promotion, but also potentially has a, an impact on your professional interactions. So if I'm going to do business with you, or if I'm going to engage in some sort of relationship with you, quite often I'll look you up, I'll Google you. I'll try and figure out what you've done before, where you've worked, that type of thing. And if I'm going to employ you these days, um, quite often a recruiter or an employer, very often these days, will run a Google search, they'll look at your LinkedIn profile. So, your online reputation, your online presence, or content that's online that relates to you is becoming increasingly important to your, to your career. Um, so we built a platform to address this problem. Um, and the problem is that this data is important to your career, but it's very time consuming and it's very difficult to find all the content that may relate to you, to monitor it on an ongoing basis, to understand its significance and how it might have a positive or negative impact. So that's time consuming, you'd have to do it on a very regular, you know, weekly or monthly basis, look for new content, and so on. So we've created a service that essentially automates that process for you. Um, so you sign up for the service, we pull your LinkedIn profile, and we then use that data to seed searches against a whole bunch of different online sources, pull content about you from uh, Google, from Facebook, from Twitter, from sites like Stack Overflow or Crunchbase where you may have some professional affiliation type data. Um, so we pull all that content and we create three what we call footprint documents categorized by content that relates to career, personal data, social data. Um, we feed all that data into a scoring and analytics engine and we produce primarily a career score. And think of a career score to be you know, similar to a FICO or a credit score. It's in the same range, it's between 300 and 850. 
And that career score represents the strength of your online brand, your online career brand. Uh, we pro provide some metrics and analytics around that, and then we also monitor that that brand and that online footprint on a monthly basis, basis and we let you know what's changed. So that, in a nutshell, is what we do. I'm not going to go into it anymore. If you want to have a look at the site, you can go to mywebcareer.com. Um, and this is what you'll see. So you've got your nice like, career score up in the top left, um, a little graphic that tells you how strong or how you compare it to other users, history, and analytics, and so on. Um, but now more about our experience and the company. So we founded the business in January 2010. Um, and that's when Nick, myself, and Brian, our co-founder, essentially left our full-time jobs, took whatever cash we could find lying around the place and in our, in our houses and so on, and plowed it into this business. Um, so we've been working on it full-time since January, but we actually had the idea in, uh, in 2008. Um, so the three co-founders, the three of us, worked at uh, Thomson Reuters together. And uh, we actually worked in the law enforcement and intel space. So a lot of the technologies and the concepts that we've applied in the product came out of that arena. So it's it's not typical. Usually you have technologies and concepts that have come out of the commercial arena going into law enforcement and intel. We've sort of done a few of that. Um, and that's created some problems for us, actually, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we were self-funded until September, and then we got some angel investment on board. Uh, we launched a beta of our product in May. Uh, it was a closed beta, so we invited only people we knew you know, through business connections and personal connections. We lost Ash, um, so we're done. Oh, okay. Can you tell Ash that we're calling back in? The microphone. Ash, we're calling you back. Uh, there is a tweet that uh, Wait. <laughs> <laughs> So that was me singing earlier. I don't know if that was my yeah. Yeah. You're running the time out. Yeah. Yes, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> So we, we launched a, a, a closed beta in May 2010, um, and then an open beta in October, actually just over a month and a half of the way from October, I think it was. Um, our business model is uh, B2C, so we're consumer focused, um, and our consumer is the career professional, but it's an individual rather than a business. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes as well. Um, and we have a freemium business model. So part of the product is free for everybody, and then we have premium services, which you've got to pay a fee for. Um, and I put a question mark beside that because we think our business model is a freemium business model, but we're still not completely sure. Um, so what I think in the uh, on the website, on the Lean Startup website, we uh, we were supposed to cover all these topics, which within 10 minutes would be physically impossible. So I'm going to focus on the first three. Um, if anyone has questions about you know, what we're doing in the cloud, free versus premium, marketing and promotion and so on, or our experience, or you've got some advice for us, well, we'll be around all evening, so feel free to hit us up. So in terms of idea, validation, and development, we, we came up with the idea in 2008, while we were still at Thomson Reuters, when there was a lot of acquisition and so on and uncertainty. Um, and we had some validation of the idea in a different market, because we had done, or we created similar systems 
but for very, very different types of customers. So think, you know, FBI agents rather than LinkedIn career professional. But we created similar types of technologies that gathered similar data and presented them in similar ways that we want to kind of did some analysis and so on. Um, so we had some degree of validation that this was something that was people found interesting and, ga and engaging and the technology worked and so on. Um, so once we started from January to March, the first three months, we were pretty lean. Um, so we didn't really do any technology development. Um, we created lots and lots of PowerPoint slides. Um, we did lots of screen mockups. So we went to we went to talk to a lot of people and showed them PowerPoints that essentially made it look like we had a product. We got really, really good at creating these screen mockups. Um, and you know, we we go and we present to a couple of people. We get some feedback. We tweak it. We go present to more people. See what their response was. So for the first three months, we were we were very lean. Um, all our all our development was in PowerPoint <laughs> and Photoshop. Uh, we talked to a lot of people. We were very iterative. Um, so as we got feedback, we changed our mockups. We changed our PowerPoints. We went out. We got more feedback. We developed the idea. Um, but we were still thinking sort of stealthily. So one of the big concerns we had starting off in January was, you know, like a lot of entrepreneurs, you think you've got the most fantastic idea and you don't want anyone to steal it. So, you know, we were we were we were still thinking very stealthy. We didn't, you know, we didn't publicize it, we didn't talk to anybody in the press, we didn't talk to any bloggers. Uh, we kept this idea between, you know, essentially among professional connections we had, the friends we had, the people we knew in the business recruiters and all that type of thing. Um, thinking back on it, we shouldn't have been thinking stealth at all. We should have just talked to everybody we possibly could, but I'll come back to that in a minute. But the first three months, we were, we were pretty lean, and it went fairly well for us. And we ended up with a, um, some, good, some good validation of our ideas and some very good feedback. So then starting in April, uh, we started work on developing the platform. Now, there's a lot of, of talk in, in lean started approach about iterating very, very quickly, even iterating daily. That's not, not something, unfortunately, that works for us because the underlying platform to do what we do is very, very complex. Um, so we can iterate on the UI side very, very quickly, but on the back end, we can't iterate quickly. It's just, there's a lot of different components, there's a lot of things going on. So we iterated weekly, which was, for us, pretty aggressive. So we had a release every week during that three months, and we, we didn't just you know shove it out the door in May or June. We had some users on board from, I think, probably around um, end of April, I would guess. Um, so we were iterating weekly. Once we, once we released and closed beta in, in May, early June, we got immediately about 100 users on board. Um, we started to get some feedback from them. Um, and up to this point, again, we were reasonably lean. I would say that the the product that we released in closed beta in June wasn't really what you'd consider a minimal, minimally credible product. It was something far beyond that. Um, I mean, we thought it was. We thought it was the least we had to do to get people using it and to show something of value, but it was probably way beyond a minimal credible product, um, we think now. Um, some of the things we learned during this phase when we, you know, we released in closed beta and we had people come on board is that you know, we, because of this sort of stealthy approach we had, we tended to keep things to our personal and professional networks. Those are the people we asked to come and test. Those are the people we validate our ideas with. And I think it's questionable whether those personal networks give you good feedback and realistic feedback because they're a personal connection or a professional connection. So they'll always tend to be pretty polite. They'll always tend to want to give you positive feedback. And even if you tell them, look, be as critical as you can. You know, don't, you're not going to offend me people still, because of that connection, that relationship, tend not to want to be overly critical. So I think one of the things we, we have questioned is how valuable um, our, you know, that, that feedback and that idea of validation is through personal and professional relationships. I think if we had it to do again, we'd you know, throw away stealth and cast the net a lot wider. Um, another thing is we went with a closed beta approach um, when we had a first version of our product we were happy with. I think, that's a, I think that was pointless. We should have just opened it up to as many people as we could have and done a lot of um, you know, split testing and some Google AdWords type of campaigns and so on and got some you know, real users rather than friends and connections and so on on board. But up to this point, we're, I'm still re I think we're still reasonably happy with how things went up to the closed beta. We could have done things, some things better. Um, from release of the closed beta in June to now is a somewhat different story. So here we, went, we started to go off the rails a little bit. 
So we released this beta, you know, we had our first version of our product, we pushed it out, we were very happy with ourselves, we are patting ourselves on the back, we got this done, it seemed to work, you know, which we were quite happy with. At that point, um, our idea of validation started to become more internal. So up until this point, we were, we were getting a lot of customer feedback and we were out talking to people a lot. And we made a lot of sacrifices when we released the, the beta version of the product. So we took a lot of features out just to get something out the door very quickly. Once we'd done that, and we got the beta out, we said, okay, great, we've got that out there, we've got some users on board. Now let's go and put back in all those things that we <coughs> took out or that we couldn't get in for the beta, all those features and all that functionality. And that was a really big mistake. So our release cycle started to get a lot, a lot longer. So instead of iterating every week, we were iterating every two or three weeks. Um, we focused more on building cool stuff. So stuff that you know I wanted to do, Nick wanted to do, Brian wanted to do, that we couldn't get into the original beta because of time. We said, okay, now we've got beta at the door, we can go back and put all these things into the product. And that was, that was a really dumb idea. Uh, we spent a hell of a lot of time on quality reliability and on learning this cloud platform, which is Windows Azure that we work on. Um, some of that stood to us, but a lot of it was wasted time. You know, if, if you're trying to get feedback on a product and you're trying to iterate quickly, you know, reliability and quality are not actually that important. You know, you can put something pretty shoddy out there, or pretty basic, as the guys before us mentioned, and you can get great feedback of it. And you're highly unlikely to get 500,000 users in the first couple of weeks anyway. So, um, another thing that was problematic for us was business model uncertainty. We spent probably four or five man weeks putting in place a subscription uh, and payment processing uh, model and technology. And at the end of the day, we decided to launch without it. So it was completely wasted time. Um, so now what we're doing is we're essentially going back to the lean approach. So one of the very interesting things is we had a, a conversation with a VC just a couple of days ago, because we're in that whole funding process now, and we showed them our, you know, our product with all the bells and whistles on it, all, all these cool features we put in, and their feedback for us was, your platform is very interesting, and we'd like to you know, keep the discussion going, but what we want you to do is to essentially, excuse the expression, but I'm quoting directly, take all this crap out, and show us something simple, and it can be quite shoddy, and then we'll continue to talk. So what they saw was lots and lots of features jumbled together, a very mixed message, wasn't clear to the consumer what the value was and exactly what they were getting. So the mistake we made essentially over the last three months was just a pile in features, sort of lose touch with the people we were trying to appeal to. Um, and now we're trying to redress that or address that by going back to essentially taking features out so what we're doing right now is pulling things back out of the product, making it simpler, doing user surveys, we're doing split testing, which is incredibly useful. So uh, Greg, that might be a good place for us to, so yeah. that's fantastic. So we just got, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, Ash, so there are uh, lots of fantastic questions coming through here, so maybe even during the intermission, you guys can talk to Ash a little bit more one-on-one, uh, -on -one. but Ash, go, you wanna go ahead and hit some of the highlights that jump through? Sure, well, I was, I guess where I was going to start with, it, it seems like there's been an evolution of, of, of having all these features. What are some of the features that you are killing now? Killing features is great. And so what are some of the kinds of things that you're pulling out and going back to that minimal viable product? And so the, the, original, uh, the original vision we had with this product was all around the career score. So, you know, having some indicator of the strength of your brand, of your career brand, allowing people to get some insight into how that indicator was created and take action on it. So sure. we, we built around that all these nice charting and visualization and data discovery and metrics tools and capabilities, and those are the things we're taking out. So now we're going back to focusing just on when a user comes to the site, they'll get their score, They'll find out how we how we generated it, get some advice on how to improve it, and we monitor it, and that's it. Um, you know, it's a much simpler proposition, and you don't have all this noise around it that have you know multiple menu options that distract users. Yeah, I agree. I I think that's also very um, you know, very attractive. People, it's the analogy of having the credit score for your for your for your career, just like you would for your credit card. Now, the one question I would have is, how often do you see, or how? How, how much variance is there in the credit score over time? Is that dependent on the type of person, or is there a lot of variance to where they want it monitored, and that's kind of your lifetime um, you know, value that you can provide? Well, in, in a career score, or in, in a career score? Yeah, yeah, in, in a career score. So if, so if I come to your site and I get a, and I get a credit score 
one time, um, is there an incentive for me to want to, to subscribe to your service so I can I can improve it or, or monitor it over time? Is what I'm asking. Yeah, I think that's where we see. That's where we want to focus the product more or less on all the data we find and charting and so on, but more on here's your score, here's how it was calculated and determined, and here are things you can do to make it go up. Okay, so the idea is to get the user engaged, so they come, they, their score is let's say 750, and we tell them, well, if you connect to a bunch of people at this company you used to work at, if you add a photo to your LinkedIn profile, if you connect to your account on Stack Overflow, your score will go up by 20 points. <coughs> Um, so that's one strategy. And then the other strategy is we're adding data sources all the time. So every time we add a new data source, which is every couple of weeks, we potentially uncover data, more data that relates to you, and therefore that has an impact on your score. And, just uh, and so, so here too, I, I see this as being you know, something that's very much in the media right now, and you, know, you get all these stories of people that aren't getting hired, and I think you started with that because of what they're doing online. So I, I think here too, you have a great opportunity to build a lot of content around this. And you know, a, a great model, I see a lot of parallels with what HubSpot is doing for inbound marketing to what you're kind of doing for a career brand is that you can almost give away that credit score uh, feature as a kind of as a gimme, but in exchange build some of these monitoring tools if there is really, you know, and that's again, going back to who the customer is and are you, is, is this, is this really a B2C play, or is there something here for in, in terms of job screening? I mean, have you done any kind of interviewing in, in that vein? Uh, we have, and there is potentially something in that area, but it's fraught with danger because you've got FCRA legislation, the you know, Fair Credit Reporting Act, that covers the use today of certain types of content when making employment decisions. It doesn't cover the use today of social network data or online data, but it sure is going to sooner or later. So it's an area that's sort of fraught with danger and legislative issues and uh, potential liability issues. So what, our approach is to make the product user opt-in. So the user opts in to generating his score and discovering his footprint. If he wants to share that, if his score has value and it makes a CV bump or, or a CV jump to the top of the pile, great. But having a, a corporate or enterprise version of this would be problematic. I just think we just have a couple of seconds left, and uh, the, I saw similar. I had a question. I saw similar threads here. But um, have you thought about just uh, doing it with the uh, Wizard of Oz approach that Artvark did, just not building any technology, doing it by hand for a while, and just trying to sell it? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, okay. Um, but I need to test out the market. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to take us down a thread we don't have time for, obviously. So, um, Ash, do you want to build on that or do you have any other final questions? Um, I don't have anything. I was just looking to see if there were any questions from the, the audience. Um, but we can certainly continue the conversation over the break if, it, if it's helpful. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things we struggle with now is the business model. It's the whole free versus freemium, how much to give away for free, when to charge. You know, should we have gone premium in the first place? That's one of the one of our big you know, issues right now. So, any, any thoughts anyone has on that? We're, we're all here. So. Well, and I would say, I mean, there too, it's, it's really a question of the interviewing. So, if you are going to be to see, it's trying to again identify who has the greatest pain. I mean, did someone not get a job because their their career brand was was bad? And you know, how do you find those kind of people and, and how do you, so it, you know, there's there's a lot, to kind of, it, it's always, you know, you have a problem worth solving. And if it's not in giving them that one-time score, then is there something in providing value over time? And I think that's where, again, the interviewing is, is, is key in helping you narrow down just who that uh, customer is with the greatest bang. Yeah, that's a good point. We got to jump to intermission, guys. Um, great presentation. Um, I, I think that you know it was, it was great to hear you guys talk about all the the, the, the challenges you've had. I've certainly um, I don't think there's a single mistake that you mentioned you made that I didn't make probably three times as bad myself. So multiple That's times. So <laughs> um, so thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate it. We're going to disconnect from the phone, um, but you guys can come up and talk to Ash.
via Skype if you want to do that. So we'll do that during the break. Okay. Okay, so before we jump up for the break, um, we have a 20-minute intermission at uh, about 8.05. I'll ask you to come back and take your seats. We don't have much time. Um, during the intermission, there's a couple things you can work on. Obviously, if you want to have any questions for the presenters or you want to look at their demos, this is a great time to do that. Um, if you're interested in presenting at a future event about your startup or you know somebody who should be presenting, please talk to Patrick. If you have any questions about Lean Startup Basics or really trying to figure out what the heck anyone's talking about, where's Alex? There's Alex. Alex has offered to, uh, to help anybody out figure out what this is all about. If you're interested in how you can keep your Lean Startup MVP fun in the part-time, Luke's going to talk about that. I, uh, I could use some of that myself right now. Um, and finally, uh, Zvi also offered to show, there's Zvi right there. If you want any update on since his presentation last month and how he's done with Structo, he'd offer to talk to you about that as well. So. Please go ahead and let's take a 20 minute intermission and when it's a few minutes before we're going to start, I'll give you a call back. A little bit about me uh, before we get into what I'm trying to do now. Um, I started out as a student at Yale. I, my first experience starting something was starting the Yale Entrepreneurial Society, which is now 10 years old, it's making me feel old. And then I've helped Yale put something together that's akin to Y Combinator Techstars, but the university runs it. It's even better because if you're a student, you get to get a statement, you meet great people like Donna Domitsky, who founded Palm and Handspring, and you give up no equity. So um, I wish I could be a student again. I started a company um, while I was a student with two other guys. We um, built it up to one public. It's, uh, it's done really well. I started another business, which um, I, th I think I forgot everything I learned with Hire One. It was a complete disaster. and. Um, a lot of the way I'm doing things now is based on the learning experiences I took out from that. Uh, I, I do quite a bit of angel investing. i um, been doing that with the guys I started Hire One with, so we've, we've backed some great entrepreneurs. Uh, some of those companies you may have heard a point about here in DC. I like those guys a lot. I was just hanging out with their San Francisco team. And then uh, I'm working with Novak Biddle as, as kind of a venture partner, EIR, looking at deals, um, investing alongside of them. And they also just said, hey, uh, I have a newborn as well. I have a three-week-old, so I understand that bump in the road. And um, they said, you might want an office to work out of that's not your home office. Said, yes, that would be a really good idea. So, <laughs> so they said, uh, we'll give you a business card and you can hang out here. So I'm doing that. So are we, uh, should I just keep going? Call on Ash directly. Okay. Hello. Okay. Here you go. Uh -oh. Press wrong. Hello. Can you hear us, Ash? Yes, I can. Okay. <coughs> so, Ash, I was just going over some of my background, which you, if you look through the slides, you, you probably saw that. Um, what I, what I've learned over the course of um, now getting into my third startup, as well as investing in entrepreneurs. I got Steve Blank's four step to epiphany. Actually, my technical co-founder of my current business sent it to me just about when it was published, and it blew my mind. I mean, he was just reading this and going, oh, so this isn't an art. Like, we can approach starting companies as more of a science, as more management, um, tools, techniques, ways to make it repeatable, and not necessarily guarantee success, but give us the highest chance of success. And then I pro probably forgot it when I started Big Home, and um, I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, and so I really feel like I really, when I looked at what made Hire One successful, what where we failed miserably with Pickham, is that in the beginning stages you're really about a learning organization. You're not actually a business yet. So Pickham, I actually hired a manager who wanted to manage a business, and that became a bit of a big disaster because it was like we don't know what we're doing yet, so we don't know what to manage. Um, we should have been managing the learning process. Um, if your product vision involves a lot of cash to implement. So that business, we were building a gambling platform. We had to get regulated. We had to buy servers and stick them in secure locations that were in regulated environments. Um, a lot of this cost a lot of money, and we should have been picking, we should have been figuring out what people want to play the games we're going to build first, not um, let's go get licensed and regulated because we had the ability to raise money. And, um, and something else which I, I should probably talk, if you're interested in it, talk to me afterwards, is that Steven, in, in four steps of epiphany, will talk about a new market, a resegmented market, um, or an existing market. And what I've come to see through my angel investing and seeing, kind of looking analytically at data on startups, is that you're most likely to succeed if you're operating in a new market. Which I think my web career is really interesting. That's a new market in a sense, like online reputation management. There wasn't anything really there. They're trying to create a new market, or you want to resegment a market. Um, 
primarily a low-end resegmentation where there's a customer segment that's overserved with current products. You can give them, you can produce something for 10% of the cost that provides 90% of the value of what's out there. And so that really, I, I've seen that those, the business, and so legal zoom is a really good example of that. Um, so that's the sort of area you want to try to play in. So now with my new team as founding, as founding CEO, you know, key is I want to find a profitable business model. I think when, when Steve says that, it's absolutely the, the key to thinking about getting a business from zero to something that's self-sustained. Um, I think that you go through three stages. I think that in the beginning, you're a learning enterprise. What is my business? Uh, what are my customers? So I, I kind of don't think of product market fit. I actually think of market product fit because I've got a product. I've got a vision. I'm going to build a minimum viable product. I need to find the people who pay me to use that. Once I've got that, once I've also figured out um, distribution channels, sales channels, uh, marketing metrics, once I have something that's repeatable, then it becomes a scaling issue. So I've got to learn how to scale the business. And, and having done that once, you start trying to scale something. So we sold universities and we have a payment product and a, um, a checking account product. When we got to university number three, and then we were going from like three to 10, all of a sudden, like the wheels started falling off because we go, oh, the way we kind of do that, that wasn't working. We have to figure out how to scale it. And then the last thing is operating. I mean, when you get to a certain size, you're, you're figuring out um, what is the right capital structure? How do we, you know, how do we better manage technology development on a large scale? What about, you might have supply chain management issues that you have to deal with. So, so it's great. You get to the operating enterprise problems, you've built a really big successful thing. Um, so we're, we're focused on the learning enterprise because that's, that's where we are now. So this is a little small, I apologize for that. What I've been trying to do now with Employee Insight and with my team, so I have this great benefit of a technology co-founder who's both a brilliant engineer as well as someone who's been harping for years to me about, about Steve Lang's ideas and, um, and has then followed with, with Eric's ideas around Agile and how to put those together. And so we've tried to think about like how do we do that into the, into the culture of the business, into our processes, so that we don't just sit here and go, oh, customer validation. Yeah, we talked to five people, they told us it's good. Che like it's not a check. It's a matter of how are we consistently say we build a small product feature. We've got a set of customers that we think it's meant for. So we think that they, we have, they've got a problem. We think we've envisioned a solution, so we've built a product. And how do we validate that we have product solution fit after we've talked to them to kind of figure out that we have, um, so we've had product solution fit. Or when we before we talked to them, we had solution problem fit from from just the discussion. So um, on, the, on the product side, we're using Agile methodology. We have two-week cycles. Um, one of the things that Mark, who, who started a month ago full-time with me, started getting to is like we have to have continuous integration because we're going to build things which are going to break the things that we had before, and we can't be quick. We can't be agile if, um, if that happens. And so he spent a bunch of time building that into our infrastructure. Um, the other thing that he's big on, which I think if you're the engineers here will appreciate, is that as you're learning, you may have to restructure things. And so you have to actually build in some refactoring time into your cycles. Um, he uses New Relic as well. So New Relic is essentially, for those who aren't engineers, is something akin to like, if you want to Google Analytics for your marketing side, New Relic will do that on your infrastructure side. So you want to understand how well it's running. It gives you that feedback so you can make your platform run better. Uh, I'm personally a big Steve Krug fan. Um, it's like, you can get the most feedback on your product for the minimal amount of effort. So the, the co basic concept is you can have, you want to have three, three people do usability testing, you're going to do one hour, you're going to do a home page review, you're then going to have a certain number of scenarios, maybe two, three, four scenarios, and you're going to learn 90% of, you're very going to quickly going to pick out, say, 10 things which are going to be Somewhat easy to fix. Sometimes they're hard, but usually they're tweaks, and they're going to give you 90% of the value. And they're not going to take a lot of time. And if you do this on a consistent basis, you're going to improve your product really quickly. Um, so Camtasia, go to meeting, or key tools to use there. Then what we started thinking about is like, okay, if we want to make customer validation part of our business, part of our culture, part of the natural process, what infrastructure do we need? And so we, we've kind of been iterating through these tools. And if any of you have tools that you use that you think are really useful, tell me because um, I'm, you know, we're only two months into this, so we're still figuring it out as well. Um, Google Website Optimizer is something which is really interesting from you can do A-B testing, you can do multivariable testing. But on the other side, you can just use it as a CMS system. 
So like we're like, oh, maybe we want to implement CMS. And I'm like, well, Mark, why don't we just use Google Website Optimizer? We can test content um, in, a, in an iterative sort of way, in a, in a way where Google Website Optimizer can do the statistical analysis and tell us what's best. But at the same time, we could just use the default and use this our CMS. So, yeah, that's good. Um, obviously, Google Analytics. Um, MailChimp, as you start developing a network of people who are customers or potential customers, and I think um, you guys talked about how you, you stuck a feedback survey on the site and then you used email, and yeah. like email worked way better, right? So using MailChimp, it's free of up to 100 people, right? So yeah. there you go, free feedback um, consistently. Survey monkey, same sort of thing, probably you know, use them in, in concert. And an interesting thing for us too, and I'll talk a bit about our product, is that we're using GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar a lot. So that's sort of screen sharing. Um, GoToWebinar, because we're actually trying, we're, part of what we're trying to build is a product that's basically a, a methodology. And so we, wanna, we kinda wanna sell this methodology to people, and this is kind of an offline product. And so we can kind of test that. So we wanna test, could we sell a one day seminar that costs $1,000? Well let's see if we can get you to give us an hour for free to listen to a webinar about part of that content. So if we could do that, maybe you know, you gave up an hour of your time to consume our content, then we could also follow up with you by email and survey monkey and see if you're would you be willing to pay a thousand dollars to get a full course, something like that. Um, okay. So what we've been focused on. As an entrepreneur, as someone who's managed a company, invested in you, I'm really interested in people. And so this is the problem that at, at a broad level we want to. You want to hire for fit. And I, I talked to the global head of recruiting at Morgan Stanley today, and this, this comes up. Yes, it's really, we want fit. And I'm like, what's fit? She's like, all the non-technical things that describe the relationship between a person and a job. And so generally people want this, but there's no methodology, and there's, there's not really a quantitative way to do it or tooling to do it. So that's what we're gonna try to build. So I have a psychology degree, and I, I did my master's research on this. And so we built up a methodology for hiring for fit, and it's centered around describing a job around psychological dimensions. I'll, I'll show it to you in a second. But we don't want to be a consulting company. We don't want to be kind of academic research. I don't want to just write a book and sell a book. I actually I want to build a software business. So we're trying to build a, a software service solution around that methodology and, and have companies consult it. So this is part of the figure out your market. Might be companies, might be consultants, uh, might be big consulting companies, maybe staffing companies, we've had interesting discussions there. Might be all of them with different products, but that's the key for us is to figure that out. So we have these offline products too, which I think makes our business a little unique, and I'm trying to apply the ideas of, of um, both Steve and Eric to, to those. So, for instance, we want to write a book, but we're going to produce a minimum viable product, which is the front cover of the book, the back cover, the intro, and a chapter. We're going to start showing that to people. Would you buy this? You know, if you read this, do you want more? Would you read more of this? And so I think that's interesting. And I mentioned seminars. This is way too small for all of you to read. I apologize about that. Um, this is the pitch for the company. I'll kind of blow through this, right? So these are the problems, like how do you find the best candidate? Uh, how do you screen candidates? Um, companies right now are just deluge, right? You put a job out there because unemployment's so high, you, can, you get so many resumes in. It's really hard to will it down, even with automated resume screening tools. Um, one thing that we learned by having customer conversations is actually HR struggles with training hiring managers how to interview well. And they'd really like a tool that would help um, hiring managers do better interviews. So that was always like a small component of our product, and it's actually going to become more of a focus. We have this big vision, so you know. We're going to help you create a job profile, uh, including kind of traditional items as well as these uh, profile in the job along psychological dimensions. We're going to then help you coordinate the creation of that profile across an enterprise. We're going to help you source people. We're going to help you assess people, all that sort of stuff. Okay. And um, so that's a big vision. I mean, this is like a big enterprise product. You can spend you know, a year or two building that. So what's our minimum viable product? So our minimum viable product we decided was just, we've got to test whether people would be willing to create a job profile. And even more minimal was, would you answer a set of questions that then we can take that data and say, here's the job profiled along these psychological dimensions, and is that useful, how would you use it, um, et cetera. So that's what we've, what we've built. Um, and and we've, we thought about how do we learn around this. So, so I'm really lucky in that I can self-fund this at this point. but. Um, we said, okay, let's say at Series A we're going to have to go raise money. 
Like, what would our deck be that if we saw it, we were like, here you go, here's the money. Like, all you have to do, we'll give you a million dollars, we'll get four million back because you understand how you're gonna acquire customers, you understand what they're gonna pay for, you understand what they want. And so it was a really fun exercise as a team to go through and we, we wrote the deck and it has blanks in it. So it's like, we use, you know, through Google AdSense, we acquire customers at this price. Our key market segments are here, here, and here. Um, they're willing to pay this. Here's why they love our product. You just kind of, and you're almost brainstorming out, but you start realizing that what you want to focus your learning on is the blanks. Um, I don't know HR people. Um, so if any of you know a lot of HR people or people in that world, I'd love to talk to them. So we, we've, we're trying to become super networked in the HR world, and that's to help us have more and more customer conversations. One of my co-founders is awesome because he likes cold calling. And so today, uh, he, he told me he cold called eight law firms. For some reason, we figured out law firms really like what we're building for their hiring process. And um, he called eight, he got two people picked up the phone, one got a meeting, one asked him to meet, and one, um, one asked for more information by email, which is probably a blow off. But even 50% success from someone picking up the phone was really positive. So I mentioned we're doing this webinar. Um, everyone, so my team is only four people right now. Every single person on the team talks to customers. And so like we have a weekly goal to go to an HR networking event, join a LinkedIn group, find someone who might have some knowledge of this and go talk to them. It doesn't matter that Mark's building the technology, he's doing it too. It doesn't matter that Adderay is joined us as kind of a cheap content creator. You know, she likes writing, she likes research. Like, Go and talk to people, you're gonna learn something. Um, and it makes it more real. And then we're, gonna, we're starting some small, efficient customer experience. I mean, almost the cold calling fits into that. So, um, if you have other ideas for how to create a learning enterprise, um, I think that's a really cool way of thinking about this. Anyone you know in HR, I'd love to talk to them. And um, we are recruiting right now uh, an engineer to join our team, probably in San Francisco, but uh, I'm here in DC. And then, um, so that's all my, all my contact info. The other thing is too, just generally as, as someone who's joined this DC community, working with Novak Biddle, um, I love entrepreneurs who take this approach, because you're gonna more likely get to the point where you have a business where you need a venture fund to put three million, five million, 10 million in to help you scale the business, where it's kind of a no-brainer, you just need the capital. Um, so definitely, you know, I'm really happy to help share what I've done wrong and right, etc. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And, uh, just so I don't forget it before we get into to get Ash's questions, I think for all of us in the community here, Sean, really thank, appreciate the, the commitment you're making to DC and coming and staying here. We're we're, uh, we're thrilled to have you here. So thanks for presenting. Thanks for talking about your past. And so um, now we'll let uh, we'll let Ash uh, ask some questions. Sure, Sean. I guess the first question I had was around this sporting methodology. Is, is that something that uh, that you guys invented, or is there? I know there's some some um, some background in the strengths finder, but is that a lot of your methodology, or is there yeah. some some other body of work that you're using here? So, so I invented that. Um, it actually comes out of my master's thesis at UPenn in the Master's in Applied Positive Psychology program, and um, and actually Tom Rath who developed Gallup Strengths Finder, which um, for those of you, the interesting thing is you go to Amazon and you look at Gallup, so look up Gallup Strengths Finder in terms of the sales. It's number 41 in terms of top selling books on all of Amazon, which is really kind of good validation too for us that there's something interesting here. But yeah, that's, that's my intellectual property. And in some ways we want to give that away. We'd love everyone to use the methodology and the ideas and we want to provide the, the tools um, to support it. Right, and, and so I, I, I like the idea, and so this is, this is a, a classic example of where the Wizard of Oz approach, I think, can really, can really work in that, I, I know you said you are building your MVP both online and offline, but I would almost say that it seems like you're also more heavily weigh, weigh, weighing on the offline anyways, but being able to, to really test out the methodology first with a handful of um, you know, customers, whether they're big enterprise customers or even smaller customers, uh, it seems to make more sense to start there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I, my, my initial reaction is, you know, starting offline before online, and then even with the book, you know, I, I certainly think the MVP approach is great, but if you can also create content in a blog, mm -hmm. you get a lot of the SEO benefits and start to build that, um, you know, expert status in, in hiring. And since it's your methodology, there's no one better to talk about it than yourself. So, so that's great. So the blog we actually have, if anybody wants to read, um, we, we just started, we have four or five articles on there. We started um, 
cross-linking, sharing content, particularly with HR networks. Uh, it's 4dhiring.com. Um, so it's, we, we started with that, so I'm glad we're headed the right direction. But I, I, think, I think you're right on the book side. Um, one of my, the things I also realized was I know nothing about publishing a book. I know that nothing about that industry. And so I've tried to get people who have written books to start teaching me about what I should do and know. And it's kind of like you need a built-in audience before you can sell a book. And so right. we've started thinking about how do we build our audience at this point. Right. And, and that's why, to me, the blog is, is that, because you, you get the SEO benefits, you get people that will find you, and, and it helps you test content for the book, which is exactly the, the path that I took. And I didn't, I, in my case, I didn't set out to write a book first, but it naturally just led to that. Um, and so I, I guess the other question I would ha have is, um, do you right now know who is your prototypical customer? Are, are they a big enterprise HR department? So, so we don't. So that's what I, I've been trying to, so, so we realized that we didn't have a big enough network across different customer segments. And I, I think of customers as self-referencing um, self groups of customers. So like the lady I was talking to at Morgan Stanley today, her, she would basically, it would be like her, Goldman Sachs, City, like there'd be a group of probably 20 people and maybe her customer segment. And, and so there, I got a positive response there, but she wants the product to go one direction. Um, I've been, I've thought that startups, venture funded startups, so you have to have at least raised enough money where you're actively trying to hire, is a really interesting segment for us. And in the first, that I have lots of access to, and the first conversations have been pretty good because they all go, we don't even have an HR function yet, but we're trying to hire people. And if we screw up and one person's bad out of you know the first 15, it really hurts us. So there, there's clearly a like, if we don't do it right, there's a problem, so we're willing to pay to get it right. Uh, and then this weird fact that law, we've talked to a couple law firms, and we kind of started with our, our counsel. We said, hey, can we talk to your HR person or the person in charge of recruiting? They said yes, and that person basically said, when can I have this? And so we were oh, we should talk to more law firms. And we've got to figure out which one of those is worth putting the most time into, and it probably comes down to asking them actually to pay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and, and that's, that's one of, you know, for us, um, that's really the next step is to say, okay, it's going to cost this much. Will you pay that? Uh, or even using exactly. Steve's approach of, okay, this is free. How would you use it? Okay, it's a million dollars. You know, what would you think then? And hopefully they go, oh, I wouldn't pay a million, but I'd pay 12000 a year or something. Ash, we have time for one more question. Sure. I would just say the, the other side of that same thing is because this is a methodology and requires you know someone to learn it first and some upfront work. They would have to also be a kind of a clear um, way to measure and quantify the ROI. So that's something. Have you given any thought to how you would demonstrate? Yeah. That? So I, so I started. Um, that was a topic of conversation today. I basically asked the the lady who's head of recruiting. I said, when someone doesn't work out, how what do you think that costs you? How do you think about that? And she was very clear around, um, it's primarily the time we spent recruiting and the time we'll have to spend to recruit the next person. And so that was like three months of a recruiter's resources. Plus she said there's usually like one month garden leave where the person will have to have left their last job. And so they'll expect to be paid, but they won't be coming into the new position. So that could be, a, I mean, for a firm like Morgan Stanley where they're recruiting really high paid people, uh, it could be a lot of money. I've had other firms that could, um, so I've talked to uh, customer service operation where they can literally quantify like a bad rep, they say it's telesales, a bad rep costs us this amount compared to others. And so it, I think it's a little bit industry specific. And so that's kind of, we've got to, I think we've got to pick an industry we go after as a beachhead and that'll let us get really good at going in and saying, okay, when you, you lose someone, when someone doesn't work out, Here's how we understand this costs you this amount of money. And they can go, oh, yeah, you're right. They're going, well, here's our solution. Here's how we think it improves your hiring. 20% better chance of success. That should translate into this amount of savings. And we're going to charge you 10% of that, 20% of that, whatever it is. So they can look at it and go, oh, that's a no-brainer. You know, we're willing to do that. That's the goal, at least. Hey, guys, we have to wrap it up here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Sean. It was a fantastic presentation. Final announcements before the best part of the evening starts. Um, first, uh, Ash, thank you so much for giving up uh, just the prep time and all your valuable time this evening to to uh, to join us here in D.C. from Austin. We appreciate it. 
Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot and, and ask you to put a tweet out on Twitter that we can all retweet. My only condition is that it has to be shamelessly self-promotional, so it better be something for your book or your blog or something you want to sell because we appreciate you helping us out and giving us all this advice. We want to return the favor. So I'll ask everybody to retweet whatever Ash posts next, and I will do it myself as well. All right. Well, thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun, and, and um, I'll have that tweet coming here shortly. <laughs> thanks. Excellent. So while Ash is doing that, um, thank you, everybody. As I said, the best part of the night is ahead of us. Uh, so afterwards, we're all going to go to dusk, which is a couple blocks away. You can follow Patrick and I and get there. Um, unfortunately, we can't remain in the building and linger and chat like I know a lot of you want to do, so we're going to have to ask everybody to exit as soon as we finish up here in an orderly fashion and uh, head out the door. You can follow us through the bar. And uh, I drink Miller Light in case anybody gets there before I do. Um, when you go to the bar, if you do go to dusk, please go directly to the bar and order right away rather than trying to wait around. You get your drinks a lot faster. Did I, did I mention I drink Miller Light in case anybody gets there before me? Thanks a lot, everybody. Our next event is going to be January 18th. We're going to take the month of December off. I appreciate everybody coming out, and uh, stay lean.